Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at this document by David H. Thiel, um, addressing Louis F. Weir's understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Plus also, uh, we're going to look at some other documents by Louis F. Weir uh, dealing with Bible principles of interpretation. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence here as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that um, there's much that we need to learn. And that as we walk with you each day, you bring us closer and closer to you and a closer and deeper understanding of your word. We know, Lord, we are frail human beings, we're so prone to err. Uh, we have limited understanding, and we need your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Be with us now in this study, uh, guide us in our discussion, and uh, we pray, Lord, that the things we learn can be useful in our Christian walk, and that we can witness to others of your power and love. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. So uh, yesterday in this study, um, David H. Thiel is going to address uh, the principles of biblical interpretation. Now, this uh, uh, you might be able to see it there on the, my shared screen. There's another document called uh, Bible Principles of Interpretation by Lewis F. Weir. And that's where he got this list from. Now, he notes that Lewis F. Weir gives his scriptural and spirit of prophecy truths or, or um, references, so we, the quotations, to support these uh, principles, right? Now, most of them we, we would agree with. We wouldn't have much difficulty in understanding that when we interpret the Bible, uh, biblical interpretation reveals Christ. Christ is the center of all scripture. He is the word of God, right? Um, we need to compare all of the scriptures. That's one of Miller's rules, right? bringing all of the relevant texts together. Now, the third one, the things of Israel now belong to the church. Um, some people call that replacement theology. But this simple principle uh, that the promises made to ancient Israel apply to all people, that Israel was meant to be a light to lighten the Gentiles or the nations. And... Um, that Israel as a nation was typical and that God's church uh, now fulfills the role of Israel. Now, evangelicals, of course, don't believe that. They believe Israel is still a part of Bible prophecy. And this principle is very important when interpreting pro prophecy. Obviously, if somebody believes that literal Israel is still God's people, then they're going to address uh, some of the prophecies literally which we know would actually apply to the church and principle four the gospel is in every passage and prophecy so that is god's word is always about the everlasting gospel uh, principle five dealing with the law of growth or development so the law of repeat and enlarge um, so we can see that the bible is progressive in its unfolding of revelation Revelation in the sense of God revealing his will, also the book of Revelation, uh, throws light upon all the preceding books. And then the law of worldwide symbolized by the local. So that, that's basically the idea of typology. But we can take uh, things dealing with these nations of the world, Egypt and so forth, and we know that these have a worldwide application. He also deals with the significance of Bible names. So we know that names are symbols, and there's all kinds of symbols in Scripture. Uh, I gave a Bible study yesterday, and, uh, you know, this lady is fairly new Christian. Uh, she, she had not really studied the Old Testament. She knew some of the stories. Uh, but we really started with, uh, you know, sin, the fall of man. And, and the gospel, the everlasting gospel. And um, I also talked to her about some of the symbols that are there. 
Uh, things like in dying ye shall die, that is, ye shall surely die. Why why doubling becomes a symbol of the second angel's message. So, I mean, obviously, she knows a little bit about this message as well, um, but has lots of pieces of information missing. But the under the understanding of Bible names, you know, Abram changes his God changes his name to Abraham. Uh, Jacob, his name is changed from Jacob, which means supplanter, to Israel, which means overcomer. You know, all of these these types of symbols are important. Now, the one that I want to look at here, um, and we're going to look at it from Louis F. Weir's document itself, the law governing spiritual interpretations. Now, of course, he puts spiritual in quotation marks because often people interpret spiritual as interpretations that are unreal, a world of fancy, conjecture, imagination, um, for they take one into a world of actuality, on the other hand. They are mental pictures of spiritual truths that are based upon things that have actually happened. So when we talk about a spiritual or figurative interpretation, it doesn't mean fanciful, right? It's not imaginative or conjecture. Now, of course, um, David H. Thiel quotes this part because it's it's written as the principle, uh, principle eight. But he accuses um, Lewis F. Weir of being mystical in his interpretations. So this clash, as uh, David Thiel uh, imagines it, between uh, Lewis F. Weir's hermeneutics and those of what he says are Miller's hermeneutics, which he says are used by Uriah Smith, we can see that this clash is is not real. That is, there is nothing about any of these principles uh, that are laid out in Lewis F. Weir's uh, book on Bible principles of interpretation that would contradict Miller's. And so we have to try to figure out why it is there in David H. Thiel's mind, this conflict. So I've tried to figure out how to approach this. Let me see if I can find the quote I was looking for. Okay, so he's gonna go, we went through Miller's rules just briefly. Thiel here is gonna go, you know, obviously Ellen White's gonna quote four of, or five, I guess it is five of his rules. And then says that, we're, you know, those that are st studying the Bible shall do well to heed the principles set forth. Uh, genuine faith is founded on the scriptures, but Satan uses so many devices to wrest the scriptures and bring in error. that great care is needed if one would know what they really do teach. It is one of the great delusions of this time to dwell upon, to dwell much upon feeling and to claim honesty while ignoring the plain utterances of the word of God, because that word does not coincide with feeling. Many have no foundation for their faith, but emotion. Their religion consists in excitement. And when that ceases, their faith is gone. Feeling may chafe, but the word of God, or feeling may be chaff, pardon me, but the word of God is the wheat. And what says the prophet is the chaff to the wheat. So, this is a problem. So we have a problem, each each one of us, because we're we're subjective creatures. We we have emotions, we have biases, we have feelings, we have loyalties, we're sinners, and God is trying to redeem us. So He's trying to bring us from this world of sin into fellowship with Him. And that's the purpose of the scriptures. So when we're dealing with studying the Bible, it's not merely an intellectual exercise, right? We understand that it is something that is meant uh, to bring us into contact with God. It's a pretty basic idea. Now, we, we've approached the scriptures in a way that uh, is... Uh, well, if we look at principle nine here in Lewis F. Weir's uh, principles, uh, he says, observe the deep inner meaning, not alone 
what is on the surface. However, the deeper meaning is not to be obtained by some fanciful interpretation. That is not necessary. For somewhere in God's word will be found the key of explanation. Now, we have all run into people uh, who have fanciful interpretations. Now, how do we decide if something is fanciful or actually deep? Right? How do we discern truth from error? How do we know what is true? It's a very basic question. So we can lay out all these principles. You know, Louis F. Weir has laid out some. William Miller has laid out some, right? These principles of how to study the Bible. And of course, William Miller says that the most important one, which is the last one he mentions, is that we must have faith. And so we know that this isn't just an intellectual exercise. This is something practical. Are, are we, we left sort of, uh, to the waves of chance and, uh, and, and human and public opinion, uh, to know what is true or can God guide us into truth? Let's say we didn't know these principles. Nobody had laid them out for us, either Miller's rules or the principles, uh, that Weir has laid out. How can we know that God can lead us into truth? How can we how can we trust that God can teach us? Because it seems there's a lot of people who are all conf are very confused in this world. You just go on social media and there's all kinds of Christians who believe in a flat earth. And there's all kinds of Christians who reject all sorts of truths of scripture. People seem to be, you know, dri adrift uh, spiritually. So how can I as an individual believe that it's possible for me to come to know truth when so many people appear not to know the truth? In, in answer to that question, I would offer uh, steps to Christ. Uh, I'm not sure what the chapter is. It's the key to limitless treasure in a sharing uh, edition, page 45. Okay. Well, through nature and revelation, through his providence and by the influence of his spirit, God speaks to us. But these are not enough. We need also to pour out our hearts to him. In order to have spiritual life and energy, we must have actual communion with our Heavenly Father. So nature, revelation, providence, influence of his Holy Spirit, and uh, prayer. Right. Real prayer. Real prayer. Yeah, yeah, speaking to God as to a friend. Yeah, uh, counting on your rosary or just reciting the same prayer every morning, sort of mindlessly, or or just only involved in sort of public prayers, but never really pouring out your heart to God. That we need we need to have that experience, that personal experience, and we need to listen to God. I like um, that one. That one. Uh, of prophecy quote where it's in it, paraphrasing it's in the intensity of the prayer is a an assurance from god that he is going to answer mm -hmm. when we pray with fervency that's a yeah mm -hmm. yeah so so we have these principles and and we know that they're not in conflict. We know Lewis F. Weir's principles are from scripture. Uh, we're going to look at a, an example of this. Of We're just going to look at one of his. And that's principle eight, the law governing spiritual interpretations. So, so we know that God can teach us, right? This is not something that we have to be in doubt about, but we know that when we first come to God, we know very little. And somehow God reaches to us and we respond. And we see ourselves as a sinner. And we, we pour out our heart to God and we ask him to take over our life or to help us in some way. And God is going to lead us. Now, the problem is that we have many people who are unconverted, um, who are religious they study the bible 
Uh, they give Bible studies. Uh, they write books. They give sermons. And they have an intellectual understanding of the truth to some degree. Some degree or other. Some, some more, some less. Some may have even had a real experience at one time in their life. But that experience has waned. And other things have taken over. Um, so just because I came to God one time in my life doesn't mean that he's still working in my life today. right? So I could be living on things in the past. Now, what we see here is that, that Thiel is saying that uh, Louis F. Weir has a system of hermeneutics that opens the door to all kinds of fancy, right? All kinds of um, error, right? All kinds of imaginative beliefs. And that we need something solid like Uriah Smith's book on Daniel and Revelation, that the idea that we can address the symbols in Daniel 11 when he doesn't consider that Revelation is all symbolic. And um, so the idea that when we understand the Bible spiritually, that is figuratively and symbolically, uh, we can say Louis F. Weir here says God is the author of spiritual interpretations. It is a mistake to think that spiritual interpretations take one into an unreal world, a world of fancy, conjecture, imagination, etc. Right? Because these are based on reality. They're images mental pictures, types, similitudes, acted parables. Right? These are the things that God uses to teach us stories. So as I was saying, I was giving a Bible study yesterday to a person who is just becoming a Christian. And, um, you know, she, she, you know, when she was a kid, she, you know, knew some Bible stories and things like that. She did go to church sometimes, but now she's, you know, seeking to be a Christian and wanting to understand the Bible. And there isn't some system that we can put in place, so to speak, that's going to make sure that you are not going to uh, be in error, right? It's, if we have, like, if we have the correct methodology or the correct hermeneutic, there's no guarantee that we're going to understand the truth, right? The guarantee is in how God unfolds to us truth. Now, God can teach each of us in, individually, but he also uses other people. So we use communion and fellowship with man as well as with God. God uses other people to show us things, things that they have learned, right? So, you know, there are people, I've run into them, they say, I don't need to listen to what any person says. God can speak to me individually. I study the Bible for myself. And then they proceed to tell me what they believe and why I need to believe it. And of course, if they thought about it a little bit, they'd recognize that if it was true, if they really believed what they were saying, they wouldn't b bother preaching to anyone, right? Because if God could teach them on their own without them listening to anyone, well, then God could do that for everyone, right? So wh why are they preaching to me? That, if, that, if, that is that is the logical conclusion. Yeah. So so we know that God uses other people. And so, you know, we study together, we share. But we are, we, and there is a hermeneutic there. But what is the basic idea of, that we're talking about here, that God can show us things? It is, it is through personal experience, through his providence, all of these different things, because God is going to redeem us, right? The purpose of scripture is redemptive, right? The purpose of revelation, whether in nature or providence or the scriptures themselves, is redemptive, right? And these are the principles that Louis F. Weir focuses upon. Now, uh, Daniel Fontenot did a... Uh, this is a video probably now must be a year and a half ago or more, maybe even more than that, maybe t over two years now, where um, I commented on the video and asked the question, which was never answered. But he was talking about uh, somebody in the movement who was teaching abstract theology. And I'm pretty sure he was talking about me, but maybe maybe it's just, you know, 
maybe he wasn't, but, but that's what I asked. Are, are you referring to me? Now, what is abstract theology? Is, is that something evil? What does abstract mean? Something outside of the norm. No, it's not what abstract means. Okay, so so abstract can, can does have different meanings uh, to draw from or separate from, uh, which is okay. So I can't. So abstract. So so we have different uh, definitions now. Where, where is this definition from, Kelly? Uh, no Webster. Okay, which is I. So to draw from or separate. Now, we don't generally use the word in that sense. Okay. So abstract has changed its meaning, just like lots of different words. And that's why I had to ask, you know, what does he mean by abstract? Because he says, we all know what abstract means. Uh, I think of that ab abstract art comes to mind. It's kind of like not reality, but uh, some sort of imagination okay so so yeah so we can think of it that way see that because the word itself it, it, let me see here i'm just trying to find a good definition we can get a dry from a latin word meaning pulled away detached and the basic idea is something detached from physical or concrete reality it is frequently used of ideas meaning that they don't have a clear act of applicability to real life and of art, meaning that it doesn't pictorially represent reality. So, so we can, it's ideas or beliefs or other intangible things. So, so they're, they're separated from physical reality. What, what did you say abstract meant, Dwight? Outside of the norm. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's sort of close, but you know, the idea is that it's an abstraction is something that is a it's it's a concept, right? A conceptualization of something. Now, now there are things that that exist that are abstract and we can think of um, love, joy, love, life, adventure. Love is an abst abstract word. Now, is love real? Uh, in action, yeah, yeah, but but the word itself, what we talk about as love, is 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 an abstract idea, right? So there is. Um, huh. Do you, do you mean intangible? Right, intangible. Yeah, that's part of it. It's it's not physical, right? Intangible. Right. That's that's what abstract means. Something that's intangible does not have a physical presence. Right. Mathematics are abstract. Doesn't mean that they don't represent reality in some way. Um, sometimes we can think of an idealization as abstract. For instance, a straight line. Do straight lines exist in reality? No, really. I don't think I don't. Yeah. I don't think so. Can't think no, of they, they don't. Or, you, you know, I mean, they, they are an abstraction, right? That they you mean, do you mean a natural, natural, whatever, natural reality? In, in nature, there's no such thing as a straight yeah. line, right? That's, yeah. yeah right? That's what I mean. But we yeah. use straight lines, you know, as an abstraction. So when you deal with geometry, you're dealing with abstractions, right? You have triangles and you have shapes and so forth. Now, we have things in reality that approximate those, but don't actually exist, right? Now, maybe if you think of a straight line, how about the idea of a, an infinitely long straight line? You know, when you draw a line and you put the two arrows, one on the left and one on the right, representing an infinitely straight line, right? And what if you had two parallel infinitely straight lines? Th these are abstractions, right? So are abstractions in and of themselves evil things? I guess is the point I'm, I'm getting to. Are they, are they lies? Are they errors? 
right? So we can use the word abstract in sort of a negative sense, right? Ellen White says Christ did not deal with abstract theories, but in that which is essential to the development of character, that which enlarges man's capacity for knowing God and increase his efficiency to do good. He spoke to men of those truths that relate to the conduct of life and that take hold upon eternity. Now, we can dismiss what somebody's saying as spiritual or fanciful or abstract, but abstract things can be useful in understanding the real world. Mathematics, which is an abstraction, can be used to understand um, you know, we can use it in engineering for building bridges and, and houses and so forth, right? So just because something's abstract or symbolic or figurative doesn't mean it's not useful. It's how we apply it that matters. So people can believe in very abstract ideas that have no practical purpose, correct? Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are some people who have difficulty with abstractions. That is, the opposite of abstract, generally in, in the psychological world, is concrete, right? So some people are, are abstract thinkers. That is, they think more symbolically. They think about relations between things, similarities. They can think quite deeply about things. And some people are just very concrete. They're very black and white, very simple in their approach to life, right? Both types of people are useful. That is, both types of people are valuable. God uses both types of individuals. But we're not all the same, right? Some people are very analytical. And they think about things in and all their relations to everything else. And some people are not. It's not better it's not morally better it's not like right or wrong it's just the way that we are and and i think part of what we're seeing here this is just my opinion i don't know david h Steele personally but i've run into people who have a very difficult time with abstractions with symbols with metaphor with allegory they, they ju there's just their brain doesn't process those things very well and and they can often be very dismissive of people who think more abstractly right because i i really appreciate uh daniel fontenot as a person now he's different than i am um but the fact that he accused me of what he thought negatively was abstract theology probably says just more about the way that he approaches looking at the world. He probably sees the world a little more concretely. It's a little more, maybe more practical than I am, right? But we shouldn't dismiss people and what people say just because it's, it's difficult for us to understand, right? We, we know that we don't fully understand others. We know we don't fully understand ourselves. And that we don't fully understand God's word. Um, and amen, amen, we, amen. Yeah, oh, and, and and things that people present to us, we may not fully understand. But one thing we know about truth is it never contradicts the plain reading of God's word, right? So if somebody comes up with something that they believe to be true, that they've because I know people like this, they, they study and they, they notice some detail and then they come to this whole fanciful interpretation of scripture that contradicts plain teachings of scripture, right? That's an pretty, example pretty wild, wild out their ideas, yeah. Yeah, well, I remember one, one friend of mine, he, he had become an Adventist, he was an actor, he was Italian, and um, he had... Uh, he read in uh, the Bible where it says, you know, ye are gods, right? And that one verse yeah. led him into uh, becoming a Buddhist. And, and so he, he, he was kind of, you know, an abstract thinker, right? So he, he, 
he looked at this thing and ye are gods. Well, that means the Bible says that we are gods, right? And so he looked for a religion that, you know, where we could become godlike, I guess. I'm not sure. It, none of it made any sense to me. And I'm not really sure. I tried to figure out what was actually behind, you know, his leaving Adventism and, and getting into Buddhism, you know, and I never really could figure it out. Uh, how he could do that you know but of course he was only an Adventist probably for about a year so not very long but um but he took this one verse and and Ellen White says all fanaticism all error is taking some truth out of its natural context and bringing it to an extreme that is we know that truth is is very complex. There's there's lots of facets to truth. And that when we're studying the Bible, the basic principle that has to always be there is that God is trying to convert us. He's trying to change our character. He's trying to bring us into relationship with, with him, to restore that relationship that was broken when Adam and Eve sinned. That's the purpose of Scripture. It's not to have some idea that other people don't understand so that you can be a part of a special class, right? So that you can look down on others. It's the purpose of scripture is not to uh, have argument with one another, right? And, and we can see this yeah. in, in everything that I've been reading and studying, you know, I've been looking at, uh, you know, the studies that we're doing on Fridays nights dealing with, uh, of the evangelical conferences and the conflicts that existed within Adventism. And the conflicts are not intellectual. They, they express themselves intellectually over ideas and beliefs and how to express ourselves. Um, and, and they become political. They become part of a party spirit of what group are you on? What side are you on? And as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians, we must understand that no man is our enemy, that there's one enemy, which is Satan, because he's the enemy of God. And uh, that the purpose that God has given us these scriptures is to remove the enmity between us and God and to create an enmity in us towards sin, right? We understand there's lots of scriptures we could look at. Now, so when we think about this in spiritual interpretations, we're going to read this here. A similitude is an image or likeness. God employed likenesses or imagery because he created the mind capable of conjuring up pictures. Educationalists right, rightly stress the value of visual education. The blessings of eyesight are very great, but the blessings of mind sight are greater. Clear thinking is an alert mind taking clear pictures, which are stored up in the memory. We forget easily when we fail to expose the mind plate long enough to enable the picture to be indelibly stamped upon the mind. Meditation is a Christian duty. Reading the Bible daily makes scriptural pictures more permanent. By word pictures, God has made the truths of his word clear, and by them he has been able to present much in little. So we can obviously, the picture is worth a thousand words, right? Now, when we think about this here again in the context of what we're discussing, that God wants to um, redeem us, he wants to change us. We have pictures, we have beliefs, we have visualizations of, of God, of our relationship with others. And we know that these are distorted. We have distorted pictures of God, right? Distorted pictures of others, distorted pictures of reality. And I was telling you like a week or so ago that, you know, I had this dream and this dream, I, I don't remember the details of it. It's just, I know that when I awoke, uh, something was really clear to me. And, and the basic idea is that we don't, we see through a glass darkly, right? We try to understand the world around us. And yet God sees and knows all. 
He is the objective observer of the universe, of our life. And we can be often torn down because of what other people say to us, other people's opinions of us. Our, our reputations can be destroyed. I actually had a dream last night, which was quite disturbing. I, I, it's, a, it's a long story in the dream, but the basic idea is that nobody trusted me. And that was quite an awful feeling. I don't know if you've ever had that, where, where people didn't trust you. Normally people trust me, but in my dream, they didn't. And, uh, and, and, uh, and this was all, it. what's that? So I've experienced that no matter what I did, my motives were suspect. Yeah. And, and, and in my dream, I, I had very good motives, but like all my family and, and everyone, like nobody trusted me. Um, it was, it was something to do with some kind of inheritance of a building. And my brother Peter was put in charge of it and, and, and I was going to help him, but nobody trusted me. You know, they thought I had some ulterior motives or something like that. And, 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 and they had never trusted me, it, you know, and they, and then they all revealed this to me that, well, nobody has any confidence in you at all. You know, we don't trust you. And, and that was such an awful feeling. Um, you know, but when you, you think about it, you know, people's perception of us and our perception of ourselves, our perceptions of reality are distorted. And God is trying to give us through the scriptures a true picture of reality. Right. We're in this darkness. We see through a glass dark. We have to see Christ. We need this revelation of Christ. And and I don't think. And, you know, I don't think that. Um, uh, you know what what people are trying to do to protect. Us from error, like David H. Thiel with his paper uh, dealing with. Louis F. Weir. I don't think it's actually helpful. I don't think it's helpful to tear down other people in order to present the truth. Now, of course, Theo believes that uh, Louis F. Weir is tearing down Smith, but I don't find that in Louis F. Weir. He's just dealing with with the Bible and presenting the truth. Now, it comes in contact, conflict with what Smith is saying. But I do believe that, that Thiel here in his, in his paper is tearing down Lewis F. Weir. I, I didn't notice, uh, um, sorry, in Weir's, in Weir's whatever commentary on Smith, or does he? And does he mention him by name? Or speak to the well, well, he does deal with Dan. Yeah, he does deal with Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel. And, oh, right, right, right. So he does, and he that's does that's fair it. enough. That's fair enough because people need to know where to go to fact check what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. So, but but Thiel is mostly using uh, misrepresentation of Thiel's character. One is he's judging his motives. Nowhere does Lewis F. Weir look into the motives of Smith, right? It's not, he's not mind reading or attributing motives. Right. But right. Thiel is mind reading all of the time. Now, and, and so we have to be really careful about that, about other people mind reading. We can present the truth, and sometimes that's going to be in conflict with what other people are saying. And it's very fair to present their arguments of what they are saying and why those arguments are incorrect. We're not saying anything about the person in doing that. It's fair and it's, it's fair. It's in fairness, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's why I don't like this thing of not naming people when you're talking about them. Uh, I, I don't think that that's fair. Yeah, that I thought really that was going to come up Be because of my comment. I say, I thought that might come up because of my comment yesterday. So yeah, that, let's talk about that. That's, that's good. Yeah, so so it's important that if because if I don't name the person, um, one is people might think I'm talking about somebody I'm not, <laughs> right? Or or them, <laughs> yeah. So so they can say, oh, so this person did this thing or said that thing, 
but but that's actually not the person who said it, <laughs> right? Right. So right. yeah. So we fair open enough. that that's to make understanding in that way, right? Because fair, much- fair, fair enough. You're but right. also, uh, when I name that person and I say, "Here's what they said," or "Here's what my experience was." You know, let's say, you know, Daniel Fontenot made the statement about this abstract theology of some person. I didn't know who he's talking about. Maybe he's talking about me. A lot of people might think he's talking about me. Maybe he wasn't. I don't know. But um, now I'm going to name that it's Daniel Fontenot, right? Because I could have said, well, this person. And you might think, oh, well, maybe that was Colin or maybe it was this other person or maybe it was Jeff or somebody, right? So so now you can actually, if you know that person, you can go to them and ask them, right? So it, it just opens mm-hmm. the door to communication. Nowhere am I attacking Daniel Fontenot as a person by naming him, right? Some yeah, people think that, that you that's are. A ma- that's a mature style of communication where you're, you're not like it's here. Uh, here where I am, the guys get talking about someone else. Uh, okay, I'll I'll use me in as an example. Okay. Like there was, there was the rumor mill and things were being said that I wasn't aware of. One person came to me and said, is this true? What's up? What's going on? And I was able to go, well, explain what was going on. And it was completely a mis- misunderstanding. It was like, you know, they didn't really know these people that were talking. Didn't have the facts. And so I I was able to, in the morning, check in where everyone's in a room. Okay, roll call's done. Everybody's ready to go. And I said, well, wait, hold on. I, I would like to say something to everyone. Is that all right? And they allowed me a few minutes. And, and I stood up in front of everyone. And I said, you know, in Hawaii, we call it the coconut wireless or the grapevine, you know it as, or gossip. I, and I said plainly to them, it's not true what is being said. I'm transparent, I'm approachable, and I'm not going to be hurt if you come to me with the, whatever may be being said. Mm-hmm. Please give me that opportunity and, and also help yourself to mm-hmm. understand more. So that's... That's not easy for people to do, but it is the right thing to do. Go to the horse. Or when a person is talking to me about someone else, I'll go, well, let's go talk to that guy. You, me, and the guy. Let's let's see what's going on. And that pretty much quashes the idea. Mm-hmm. No, and, and, and it's extremely important to have that type of communication, especially when there's a conflict of some type, you know, like uh, a theological conflict. People need to spend time together. And that, and that's been one of the problems of the social media since, you know, 2020 is that our actual time together with people that has the fact that we don't have that time, I think has created some of the conflicts within the movement to some degree, Mm -hmm. or at least exacerbated them. Mm -hmm. Isolation from each other. I mean, Zoom, Zoom is good, but. It's 10 times better when we're able to be in the same room. Well, you know, if I can't see people's expression, you know, I mean, most of the time, I just assume all of you are sleeping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I miss it, missed, like I used to drive from Calgary to Edmonton for a Bible study. Yeah. To be, to be with the people and COVID cut, shut that down. Yeah. Like I, it's a six hour round trip, you know, I'd stay overnight, but. But yeah, I, I, that's how important it was for me. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we can see that that you know these these are important issues. These these principles that we have here, these are part of of something that's a bigger picture of the, of what God is trying to do. Now he's he's going to go through here uh, pictures of an innocent, unblemished lamb slain because of an individual sin presents an impressive picture of Christ's substitutionary death. So obviously we know that the offering for sin, there's a lot of abstractions in the sanctuary service. The idea that you're taking blood, right, 
and it represents life and it's going to carry sin with it. Does the blood actually carry sin with it? When somebody confesses his sins upon the head of a lamb, can sins actually be transferred to the lamb in reality? What is that one about the blood of bulls and goats? Doesn't yeah. What? How does that go? The blood of the blood of bulls, bulls and goats does not take away sin, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. We we need a greater sacrifice now. But even then, in Christ's sacrifice, when we studied uh, E.J. Wagner, his what so-called deathbed confession, right? His his confession of faith that he wrote just before he died, where He's writing to a friend and says that, you know, he's, he rejects this whole idea of the investigative judgment, you know, the idea that, you know, that Christ's blood could be, you know, still dry <laughs> or still wet, that it, it would now be dry. And how could you sprinkle dry blood? Mm. You know, I mean, what? that's an example of, of somebody not understanding something that's obviously abstract. Nobody believes that Jesus is actually literally sprinkling his blood in the sanctuary in heaven, right? Well, yeah, and that's kind of what they use to mock the idea. Uh, not they, I don't know who they are, but I, I've heard a mocking of that. The other one, I, yeah. this reminds me of is, what is this new thing? Uh, you know the guy's name, supposedly un, uh, discovered under Golgotha, the blood of Christ. Yeah, you're talking about um, that guy. I can't think of his name. Yeah, the charlatan. Ron yeah. something? Ron Ron Wyatt. Ron Wyatt, yeah. And people in Adventism, are, some are like they're they're taking that hook, line, and sinker, not really investigating it. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a proven charlatan, right? I mean, he, people who worked with him said, you know, he, he, he was constantly lying. And of course, he doesn't have any of this evidence. It's just claims. But anyway, the, the point is that people can, you know, can a man enter his mother's womb, right? You know, Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. right? You must be born again. Obviously, that's an abstraction. Here, here's another one: is the uh, the Noah's Ark in, on Mount Ararat, and they see this shape of an ark. Geologists uh, investigated that with seismic uh, machines, and it's well, natural, natural rock formations. Form, na natural rock formations, and they're all over the place there. Well, you, well, they're actually caused by glaciation. I mean, it. it what you're looking at is some terminal and lateral moraines, right? So. Uh, Rocks that drop out from the glacier as it's moving. Yeah, it has to do with how. Uh, the, yeah, because it, it's yeah. it's not a, a solid thing. It's just it's just, uh, you know, you, you look at a picture from a distance. Looks, oh, it's kind of shaped like a boat. But these are common things in in mountainous terrain. So there, there's not like a unique sort of thing. This one's larger than some, but there's one's lots larger. But anyway, <laughs> the point is that when it comes to understanding the truth, what God is trying to do is he's using illustrations, right? Word pictures. They're, they're not, we don't believe that, that these things actually, like the lamb doesn't actually, you know, carry sin. Sins is not transferred by confessing sins on the head of a lamb. Nothing really happens. It's symbolic, right? Of what Christ is going to do. Right? And so these different stories, David's victorious conflict with the great Goliath provides us with a clear picture of what it means to live the victorious life in the power of Christ. Right? So these are real events that have happened, but, uh, they're, they're presenting spiritual truths. Right. The historical incident, incidents recorded in the Old Testament provide us with word pictures by which God teaches us spiritual truths. In them, we see things worldwide in scope. They are spiritually discerned. In the days of Jeremiah, the Lord taught the people by means of a series of acted parables. That's from Prophets and Kings 4.23. Acted parables presented pictures of spiritual things. When on earth, Jesus pointed to nature in teaching spiritual truths, word pictures of earthly things with heavenly meanings. The unknown was illustrated by the known. 
divine truths by earthly things with which the people were familiar. The scripture says, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables. Natural things were the medium for the spiritual. The things of nature were connected with the truths of the written word, thus leading from the natural to the spiritual kingdom. No more effective method of instruction could he have employed. That's Christ object, object lesson 17 to 21, just selected quotes there. A wise purpose underlay every act of Christ's life on earth, Desire of Ages 206. He taught spiritual lessons in every miracle performed. Uh, the cursing of the fig tree was an active parable. He invested the tree with moral qualities and made it the expositor of divine truth, Desire of Ages 582. Every act of his life, every word spoken, every miracle wrought was to make known to fallen humanity the infinite love of God. Now, for some people, these things are fairly abstract. They're hard for them to understand. Children generally are more concrete and less abstract. And so, you know, when children, when you, you know, say Jesus is the Lamb of God, you know, they have a hard time separating the idea of the picture of a lamb uh, from uh, the abstraction of what that means, right? That's why um, William Blake in his Songs of Innocence, you know, he has this poem, The Lamb, where, you know, I can't remember how the poem goes, but basically the idea that this child, you know, it's, it's sort of a child poem, uh, thinks about Jesus as a lamb, right? And that I'm also a lamb, but not realizing that a lamb is going to be slain, right? Child just thinks of a lamb as this cute, you know, fuzzy creature. You know, so to understand the implications of Christ being a lamb, a child, Songs of Innocence, doesn't recognize what that really means, right? So children, when they, you know, they learn Bible stories, they uh, don't fully understand the symbolism that's there, right? So they can learn about the story, but later in life, those stories can come to their minds as they get older and they start to understand metaphor more. But some people have a very difficult time understanding metaphor. Uh, I always did growing up. I was not good at metaphor. I wasn't good at jokes. And uh, like understanding humor, uh, I took things very literally. Um, but, you know, as I got older, I developed the ability to understand uh, more symbolic things, especially studying the Bible. The Bible really changed uh, my life, my ability to understand things. So I believe people can can develop that. The Lord emphasized the value of spiritual interpretations when he had the experiences of his people recorded in the Old Testament to be spiritually applied by his church. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15 verse 4. Not only were these things written, but Paul declared that they were written for our learning. Thus it is clearly stated that God had these things recorded to be employed for his people. In New Testament times, this includes whatsoever things were written, which covers far more than the sanctuary and its meaningful services. Again, Paul states, now all these things happened unto them for types, and, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world are come. So that's uh, for types and, and that uh, for in samples, it says in the King James, that that word there in Greek is typos typos or typos so that's like types right in this instance also paul did not limit the use of types and anti-types to the sanctuary and its services he refers to the experiences of israel the historical incidents recorded in the old testament again paul stresses the fact that god purposefully had all those experiences written for our admonition in the Old Testament, as types of the experiences of his people living in New Testament times. In this very passage, Paul quotes a few of the experiences and shows what he means. And did it all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ. The literal manna, the literal water, the literal rock, have spiritual counterparts in the kingdom of Christ. He is the manna that sustains his people in their wilderness journey. The smitten rock points to the cross of Christ, and from whence flowed the water of life 
which satisfies his pilgrim people. The spiritual application of the things of Israel runs all through the New Testament. Without understanding the principles which govern their antitypical use, one cannot discern the real significance of certain prophecies in the book of Revelation. Jesus applied the giving of manna as the giving of himself, the living bread. Like the manna given in the wilderness, his grace is bestowed daily for the day's need. Like the hosts of Israel in their pilgrim life, we may find morning by morning the bread of heaven for the day's supply. Now, this also reminds me of of, uh, the verse that says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So even though God has given us these spiritual applications of scripture, they cannot be understood by the natural mind. Do we believe that? Spiritually things must be spiritually discerned. Yeah, do we believe that? I do. Yeah. And and I think that that's why um, some people can't see the spiritual application of the scriptures is because in order to do so, they have to confront Christ. That's why Nicodemus would say, you know, must a man enter again into his mother's womb? You know, when Jesus says you must be born again. The confront seems to have a, a negative argument. Kind of. Uh, anyway, I would say encounter. Right? Well, I'd say confront um, it for this, because in reality, it's it's. It's not some casual encounter with God that we are avo- avoiding. We are mm-hmm. avoiding God seeing us, seeing our sins, right? Uh, us uh, seeing uh, our sins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True. I mean, true. The experience of Isaiah being in the presence of God. But the first time, uh, my conversion, it was mm-hmm. a very, very loving warm presence oh, well it, it is. is very real yeah but when you come into when, God's I, presence, when i when i hear when i hear the word confront it seems more like you're going to have an argument and we are in a sense like later on maybe some people yeah, but, have that experience where what was it william miller and his experience with uh i don't know yeah, well, yeah, so the point that I'm making here is that people who avoid this confrontation, that is, they don't want to have to look at their sins. They don't want to have to confront God because confronting God means they have to confront the reality of who they are. Now, once you do that, I mean, it, it's it's a totally different experience because when I came to God, when I was converted, All I felt, you know, once I came to him and confessed my sins and saw the reality of who I was, as much as God could allow me to see, as much as I was able to bear, I felt at peace with God, right? Yeah, my experience wasn't confessing my sins. It was uh, reaching out to God. It was the first time that I ever spoke to God. Right. But you're going to be at peace, right? Yeah, yeah. The peace was... Yeah. But if you but if you had avoided God, right, if we if we avoid this, if we 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 sense that God is there and and we don't want to approach him. Right. That that's what I'm talking about. That's why I'm using. Oh, OK. Av- avoiding right? the avoiding. Yeah. 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 You sense so God's there, but you want to. It's yeah. uncomfortable. So you. Yeah. We don't we don't want to confront God because we would have to confront ourselves. And, and so the reason why people don't understand the Bible, because it is spiritually discerned, um, you can't just understand it intellectually. You have to come into contact with God. You have to come into contact with who you are as a person to actually understand the Bible. And, and I believe that there are many people who study the scriptures who never come to know God. They, they can be pastors they can be elders they can be sabbath school teachers they can be church members and they have an intellectual understanding of the doctrines of adventism but they have never come into contact with god i believe that's true 
right? The, the, the Bible verse would be it ever learning but never coming to a knowledge, the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. And, and we know that that, I mean, we're told in the Bible that it's true. We're given examples of it. Now, it's not for us to d- decide on each individual person whether that's true or not and what somebody else's experience is. But we do know that it's possible. And we, and it could be happening to us. That is, we may think that we know the truth because we know a bunch of things, um, but that we're not actually open and honest to God. That we we can use uh, righteousness as a cloak, right, to hide our sins. Because remember, Christ has to remove our filthy garments from us before he puts his righteousness upon us. But man can put his own righteousness upon the outside. He can be a whited sepulcher. Or, mm-hmm. you know. I, I had an experience last night, actually, with the, the, the contrast, because there's three of us talking. And one of the fellows, you know, he he's quite adamant. He doesn't believe in God. He was raised in the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And he mm-hmm. just says he doesn't believe in God. And another guy was arguing with him and kind of mocking him and so on. And I, I listened and then I offered something, you know, and we went back and forth calmly and rationally. And he, today he said, you know, that guy, man, I was going to punch him in the face. <laughs> and uh, He got so rattled by it. And he said, but when I was talking with you, there was respect. And yeah, I wasn't trying to push. I was just offering different ideas, a way to look at things. And mm-hmm. he's looking, he's looking because I wasn't, kind of, you know, pushing my idea. I was just offering. Well, what about yeah. you ever think about it this way? Yeah. So and, and, and there's lots of things that I'm thinking about here, you know, at, at the moment, uh, because I'm studying other things. Obviously, the, the study for uh, Friday night. Uh, tomorrow night, you know, dealing with uh, the evangelical conferences. Now, we had our leaders, um, you know, try to make overtures to the evangelicals, which they went too far. And they tried to adopt the language of the evangelicals in order to win them over, right? So we know that there is, with language, language can be manipulated. That is, you know, you can have uh, the same words mean different things to different people. So you can make a statement, you know, Christ had a sinful human nature, or Christ had a sinless human nature. Those two different statements um, can mean the same thing depending on who who you're talking to. Because I've talked with people who said, well, Jesus had a sinless human nature. Now, when I sit down and talk with them about it, what they mean is Jesus had the same nature you and I have, but he was sinless, Right. That's what they mean. Right. Well, of course right. he had our nature, but he didn't sin. Well, yeah, right. That's what I'm saying when I said Jesus had a sinful nature, but he lived a sinless life. And they said, well, I can agree with that. Right. But but different people can mean different things by that. So some people say Jesus had a sinless nature. They can They can mean that he had the nature of Adam before Adam fell in the sense that, you know, he, he didn't have any real temptations from his nature, right? So there's all these little fine sort of distinctions that people make in language. So language can be easily used to manipulate. And now I I think to some degree, you know, that maybe the leadership of the Adventist church, the people who entered into those conversations with evangelicals had some good intentions, but they made a number of mistakes. One is to be secretive. The other is uh, to not be inclusive in allowing other people to be a part of those conversations and then pushing the publication of a book that many people disagreed with. Right. So, you know, when it comes to understanding the truth, when it comes to the conflicts we have with others, we need to be open and honest with others, just as we are with God. We need to be open and honest with God. We need to be open and honest with ourselves. So, again, this isn't about, you know, having the right methodology. Like if you just if you can nail down the proper list of principles of biblical interpretation, that somehow that's going to guarantee 
you know, your entrance into heaven or the understanding of truth. Because we have to deal with the sin problem. That's the biggest barrier to understanding truth. Now, when we when we look at um, here, we're looking at Louis F. Weir's uh, principles of biblical interpretation still. You know, he's going to just show all of these examples of types. So in nowhere in here is there anything that would suggest an opening of the door to all kinds of fanciful interpretations. Now we have the principle number nine, observe the deep inner meaning, not alone what is on the surface. One may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty and comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. Uh, Steps to Christ, page 95. His words are truth and they have a deeper significance than appears on the surface. All the sayings of Christ have a value beyond their unpretending appearance. Minds that are quickened by the Holy Spirit will discern the value of these sayings. They will discern the precious gems of truth. Uh, Though these may be buried treasure, Christ Object Lessons 110. We do not go deep enough in our search for truth. God wants our minds to expand. Testimonies to ministers, 11.9. While some portions of the word are easily understood, the true meaning of other parts is not so easily discerned. There must be patient study and meditation and earnest prayer. Testimonies to ministers, uh, 10.7. The truth of the Bible must be searched, dug out by painstaking effort. For selected messages, page 20. Investigate, compare scripture with scripture. Sink the shaft of truth deep into the mind of God, God's word. Testimonies to ministers, 476. How do we sink the shaft of truth deep into the mind of God's word and thus comprehend the deep and hidden meaning? The heavenly injunction for us is to study, search, rightly divide, investigate, sink. Sink the shaft of truth deep are equated with compare scripture with scripture. So he has an application. The spiritual significance of Abraham offering his only son Isaac on the mountain where later Jesus was permitted by his father to offer himself as a sacrifice is obvious. Many times the inner meaning is not so transparently clear. However, the deeper meaning is not to be obtained by some fanciful interpretation. That is not necessary. For somewhere in God's word will be found the key of explanation. The entire system of Judaism was a compacted prophecy of the gospel. Desire of Ages 2.11. After his resurrection, Jesus established the faith of his disciples by explaining the types and prophecies of the Old Testament. The Desire of Ages 7.96. Right? So we have this accusation by um, Theo and... Uh, I, I just got to find it here. Let's, he used this word mystical, right? By this reasoning alone, he, prom- he is alone promoting a figurative, mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture, right? So is figurative. Now, now we could say here figurative. He's distinguishing this from mystical. But, but I think he's putting these together. He's saying figurative is mystical, right? Rendering a literal plain passage of scripture. So he's, he's taking a literal plain passage of scripture, what's on the surface, and he's finding some deeper meaning, um, and that becomes mystical, right? So he says, well, what, what, uh, Theo is saying is that the gathering of Armageddon that happens during the sixth plague, and by Lewis F. We are saying that the gathering begins or commences prior to that point, that it doesn't just start there that it starts even prior to the close of probation, that this reasoning alone is promoting a figurative mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture. And of course, when we read what Lewis F. Weir says, we don't get that impression. He, He has very good arguments of why that gathering together has to begin before the close of probation, that it's a process. That's not undoing or contradicting what is actually being said in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a process that goes on in the hearts of hearts and minds of men, mankind. It, it's a process. God, how does it go? Like the idea that 
you know, God speaks to everybody and, and uh, eventually everyone's going to, needs to make a decision. And that God gives each person time, varied circumstances and over and over, bringing them over the same ground, trying to convince them the Holy Spirit uh, woos us long, long. Yeah. And uh, the rejection of that is not something that that happens just with in a moment. It, I mean, it, eventually a decision does take place in a moment, but that decision is not something that God requires of us without sufficient evidence yeah. and me you know, speaking to us over a long yeah. period of time. Okay. Now, now we know that the the issue that we're addressing here has to do with the interpretation of scripture. That we can look at the scriptures in a de- in a figurative way, and that figurative way leads to a deeper understanding of scripture. Right? That is, if we just read the scriptures as stories that happened, um, I mean, maybe we could have like a little you know, you know, parable at the end of each story and what we learned. Uh, about that story like we do with kids we tell a story children's story and then we say you know and this is the lesson we learned from that story and that's how some people approach the scriptures but we understand that the scriptures are extremely deep that they reach into the very soul of each of us individually they can speak to us individually with the bible study i gave yesterday i focused that you know, that person i, I emphasized that that person can know God personally through the scriptures and that just because they don't know everything about the scriptures yet, uh, they never will, (laughs) that that will just continue to grow as their relationship with God grows, their understanding of the scriptures will grow and, and that they need to study them prayerfully. They need to recognize that studying the scriptures is a personal experience that they come into contact with God that somebody leading out in a Bible study can't do for you what God can do for you, right? There's there's a point, you know, people give Bible studies, you can direct a person to God, you can direct them to certain scriptures, but there is a work that they have to do because they're participating with God as they study God's word. There's a power in God's word that's personal, right? And so when we have Lewis F. Weir, making this statement regarding, sure, there's going to be this battle of Armageddon, but we need to recognize that right now we are making decisions before probation closes that's going to determine whether or not we shall be destroyed in Armageddon. And that David H. Thiel then says, well, that statement alone, this reasoning alone, is promoting a figurative mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture. Well, is there any literal plain passage of scripture that does not have a figurative and mystical uh, application? Well, Armageddon is in the book of Revelation, which is a book of <laughs> symbols. Yes, yeah. But I'm just saying, does is there any scripture that we can just say, I'm only going to take the scripture, what it says on the surface, and I'm not going to look beneath the surface. Yeah, no, uh, even lately, the Bible has become like, to me, like, uh, I'm almost like an electrician carefully removing the cover to work on high voltage power. (laughs) (laughs) Because when I open it, every, 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 verse every word even it just is so powerful to me right now yeah could could you imagine i I mean i have a hard time imagining it but but i I believe that this is true that that there are people who can read the bible and and only read it on the surface that they they look for those arguments that are on the surface to support or reject different ideas Right, that the Bible to them is what's that? Reading, reading it as an intellectual exercise. Yeah, and also as something within a di- dialectical environment. That is, there are doctrines you need to believe, and that you have to get them from the Bible. And here's what the Bible says on those doctrines, and 
and not being able to go deeper than that. There definitely are people who approach the Bible in that way. Having a form of re- real, what is it? A form, form of, of godliness. Godl- form of godliness, but denying the power of it. Yeah. Now, and, yeah. and I don't mean to be hard on, on any particular group, but in, in my experience with Jehovah's Witnesses, I find that this is, is fairly common. It is the Bible is just about a bunch of doctrines that you have to have correct, right? And, and, I, and I've run into Adventists with that as well. And I've run into lots of people with that type of thinking, not just in, in biblical terms, but in, in other ways that people approach the world in sort of this uh, two-dimensional way of looking at things, that, that they can't have any depth. There's just certain rules. Now, sometimes, you know, some of these people I know actually have like mental deficits that that uh, have a they have a hard time looking at the world other than a black and white way of looking at things. Things are are completely binary in the sense of everything, right? Things are either good or bad. There's no such thing as a gray area, and and they approach God that way. They approach other people that way. So. You know, when we deal with this issue, because I've tried to figure out now, how do we address this problem of hermeneutics? We could have gone like through each point and and try to, you know, address these different points. But we know that Miller's rules and Lewis F. Weir's rules are the same rules. Right. There, there isn't a conflict. Thiel is trying to say that there is. So Dave, David Thiel is saying, you know, there's this conflict. It's a contradiction. And, and so he says, you know, this conclusion contradicts what Ellen White wrote. It also overlooks what Ellen White wrote about the revelation of Christ as it relates to the infinite justice of God. So he's going to have uh, this statement here. The severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor may be judged by the Lord's reluctance to execute judgment. The nation with which he bears long and which he is not. He will not smite until he has filled up the measure of his, its iniquity on God's account. will finally drink the cup of wrath and mixed with mercy. When Christ ceases in its intersection of the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark will be poured out. Right. So he's looking at this in this very black and white way. That the gathering of Armageddon happens during the sixth plague. After the close of probation and by. Um, Lewis F. We are saying that the gathering begins prior to the close of probation. He sees it as a contradiction. He sees it as a black and white issue. And he's not recognizing the nuance in which Lewis F. Weir is presenting this. Lewis F. Weir is not contradicting the idea that the plagues begin before the close of, like, that the plagues are after the close of probation. He's not suggesting they begin before the close of probation. But that's how Thiel is taking him, right? Because he's going to give all these arguments to try to to argue against something that Weir is not saying. And, and, and we need to be careful when we communicate with people that we don't argue with them about things that they're not saying. We need to understand what people are saying, even if they're expressing themselves differently than we would. We can't say... Well, if you're saying this, that means you must think this. I've had that happen to me so many times, right? And and we see this in a lot of the debates, the debates over the Godhead and Trinity and, and so forth. People keep putting words into other people's mouths. Well, if you believe this, then you have to accept all of these other things. And and that's not necessarily the case. So this is another, why is the mystical like that? Okay. So he's going to try to um, address, this is much later in the paper. So we'll probably look at this later. But he's going to try to say that this whole mystical thing is connected to the Catholic way of studying. All right. So where were we here? So we got these principles. Then he's going to have Miller's rules, which he thinks are a contrast to that. Right, so we don't need to go through Miller's rules. And Ellen White obviously affirms those rules. We all agree with those rules. So not as a criticism of Thiel, but it, it's 
you know, as a person, his spiritual life or anything. But but he does have this difficulty of looking at things more nuanced. Now, he may think that that's you know, the whole idea of nuance it, that I've run into people that think nuance is satanic. That basically what you say, the words you used is what you mean. Right. So an example of this is, you know, people will sometimes uh, claim that I said certain things. And I'll say, well, I did say those words, but here's what I meant. And they'll say, no, no, no. Those words that you used are what you meant. Now, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with somebody saying, no, I won't let you define your words. I have to you. You have to take those words that you said are what you said. Any any sort of clarification of your words are not allowed. What's wrong with that? Our time is up. But uh, anybody want to comment on that? A whole lot of things are wrong. With that. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh... It's him telling it's someone telling somebody else what they mean. It's, it's just it's just not fair. I mean, there's so many definitions even for one word. Never mind an idea. Yeah, and and not to offend any women who might be watching this video, but w women are often will say, you know, a husband says something. You know, he didn't quite express himself the way he should have. And a woman can get very caught up on, well, those are the words you said that must be what you really meant. It's, it shows what you really are thinking, right? Uh, uh, hopefully all of you men who've been married have all experienced this. I'm not the only one, but, but we can't do that. The reality is that people, people can mean different things by words. Words are themselves not precise. So we have to allow a person to explain themselves, to say that they can't explain themselves and they have to be tied to some words the way that you interpret them is extremely unfair. But anyway, let's uh, close with prayer and we'll come back to this on Sunday. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here today. I pray for a blessing for each person that you can work in their lives today and that they can experience uh, your peace your grace, your mercy, and your power in their lives in overcoming the defects in their characters. We know, Lord, that we need you. And um, we pray that you can watch over and care for each one of us, for our families, our loved ones. And um, we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.